Good morning. Make sure that all of this stuff works. Uh, we had to make it as complicated as possible by bringing three people down to uh, give this presentation. So we're, as Phil says, we are from the University of South Carolina, and we are part of the security operations and incident response team. So our talk is a little bit different today in that it's not super technical, but we're gonna talk about uh, people, process, and technology. So since it's Security Onion Conference, we'll talk just a little bit about Security Onion, but it's not gonna be super technical. Part of the rationale behind this talk is a lot of y'all are influential people in security operations. You might be ma in management or you might create applications that are used by security operations teams. So we wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on in an environment, in a university environment, where Security Onion is being used. So a little bit about us. I'm Robert Wilson. I'm the Director of Security Operations and IR for the university. I've been with the university for about two and a half years. So I came from South Carolina state government, and I've been doing this kind of stuff for a very long time. Um, Jonathan Martin has been with the university since the 1800s. So he, he, he is our institutional knowledge. And then Alex Galloway also came from state government and he's been with us for about six months to a, not, not quite a year. So to start off with, let me just set the stage for you a little bit. A lot of you, there might be people that come from higher ed that are here. Higher ed is what we would refer to as a target rich environment. So if anything exists, we have it. So when y'all, you know, you're looking at Twitter and there's some CV that comes out and a lot of times people say, oh, we don't have that. Well, our perspective is where is it? Because almost every time that something comes out, CV wise, you know, configuration, any, anything, we, we have it. So on the Columbia campus, we have roughly 40,000 IPs that we can see on a daily basis. There are comprehensive campuses. There's one right up the road in Aiken, uh, upstate South Carolina, and some various other locations. So it's extremely complex. The other part about the complexity is we are highly federated. So if you work in government and you know about the way that executive branches work, where you have an executive, you know, you work in, in the federal space or state, you got an executive and then you have a bunch of cabinet agencies or people that are actually do, doing the work. The universities are somewhat like that in that you have a president and then you've got deans in colleges and you've got other campuses where they have chancellors. So there are a lot of people who have input into processes in uh, academia. So what that turns into is there are a lot of chiefs a lot of times, and the complexity is not just technical, it's also political. So we in the security operations and IR area a lot of times we're operating more like a MSSP because we don't necessarily know what's going on in an environment until we get there. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how, how we're beginning to address that and, and that kind of stuff. So for, uh, since you know a lot, we're all nerds, right? So we are interested in technology and you know what do you have it's, if it's highly complex and it's a target rich environment and all that kind of stuff. We have everything from a research cluster that has multi terabytes of RAM and 15,000 cores down to NT4 boxes that are connected to lab equipment that you who knows what, what the status of it is. You could have a, my wife works in theater, and they could have some kind of theater device that's IP connected that's gonna send sound from a Macintosh to a speaker, and the speaker run, runs Linux. 
right? So it could get taken over because it's never going to get patched. <laughs> so a lot of what we're seeing on the network is, you know, basically one of everything is what it comes down to. Data-wise, we have PCI, we've got CGIS, we have a power plant, we have uh, medical facilities, anything that you can think of, we're kind of, it's kind of like a town. We run our own ISP, so we have students on campus, wireless networks that have PlayStations on them, uh, Tor, you know, Bit, you know, what, whatever you think, we've got it. So you can't think of it in terms of, uh, you know, we're a corporation and everyone's going to run, you know, whatever the newest build of Windows 11 and et cetera, et cetera. So there are pockets where we can do that kind of stuff, but we have to be able to do IR for all of it. So here is a shot of what 24 hours worth of traffic on our network looks like. So Security Onion Conference, all of our data runs through Security Onion as far as our SIM, that's what we use for our SIM. So Part of what we're going to talk about today is if we are moving toward doing student-driven services, we want to be able to bring students in to sit down in front of Security Onion, our internal, internal tools and all that kind of stuff when they were working at Chick-fil-A or Starbucks the week before. So we, so there's three of us here, there's a, a couple of other full-time people. That, that's not a uh, sustainable number of people for the amount of complexity that I just described for us to get better over time. So what we said was, we have all of these students, we've got these cybersecurity programs, we're going to switch to having a student-driven SOC. So our one, phrase that we use to describe that is that we have a teaching SOC. So a lot of y'all are familiar with the concept of a teaching hospital where medicine still goes on, but you have medical students that come through, you know, future dark doctors. We have future information security analysts that come through our SOC. So we want them to be able to go out and make much more money than we make. <laughs> and it happens all the time, which is, is good. Yeah. So you're a new student, you come in, this is what 24 hours worth of traffic looks like, and you sit down at your console, and you see this. So I'm not going to disparage tools, but I will talk about some ways that things can be done a little bit better, and there are some big gaps in the triage process. A lot of what we're going to talk about has to do with triaging alert. So this, y'all are familiar with this probably, so this is the hive. New analyst sits down. They've got one IP talking to another IP, and it's an alarm. Last week they were working at Chick-fil-A or Starbucks or nowhere. You know, maybe they have no, no experience even with working at all. They sit down, and it's an alarm. And then they talk to the analyst that's sitting next to them, and the analyst says, all right, let's do this. This is what we're going to do. You're going to import that alert and move it from being an alert to a case, run the enrichment steps, find out w which computer it is out of the 40,000, find out whether or not that attack e is even applicable to the computer, et cetera, et cetera. So this is intentionally over the top so that you get an idea of what it felt like, and it probably felt like this to many of the people that are in here when you started, right? Because th this, this isn't unique to students. This happens with full-time staff also. So this is the kind of thing that we're working to address. Jonathan could sit down with a, a new student and go through all of these steps, but really what you're doing is you're reinforcing the way that it's always been done and that's kind of what we want to get away from. So, well, it's not kind of what we want to get away from, it is what we want to get away from. So the problems that we identify with this, and this is basically what my role is, is to push this kind of stuff. So one of the advantages to coming into a new environment is to look at everything and say, why are you doing this? 
That basically is what I've been doing for the last two years. Why are we doing it this way? That stuff that we were just talking about is extremely manual. Why are you making someone run, e even if you're going into the hive and you're gonna run enrichments, why isn't that already there? The, uh, stuff like that. The, uh, the other part about it is it kind of reinforces, and this is a soapbox thing, uh, because we, in my previous life, I worked at an agency where we had interns that went off and got security jobs, and there was a lot of culture of RTFM and Googling. You know, I had to learn how to do this by you know someone telling me read the manual, you know, or Google whatever that alert is, all that kind of stuff. The problem with that mindset is that autonomy given too early in a process is a burden. So it is, it is a true statement that people need to learn how to figure out how to do this stuff. But someone that is in the beginning of their career, you may turn them off from doing security work it, at all by having that, that kind of mindset. So it takes skill to, deter, to figure out when you need to tell that person, go out and Google it versus you, you know, spending more time with them. And I can guarantee you that someone that comes in that's been working at Chick-fil-A, if they haven't already done a lot of work on their own, 99% of the stuff that they're gonna see that comes in, they are not ready to Google it. They, they, you know, what is a port? They, yeah. they don't even know what a port is. So you, you have to spend a lot of time with people going over that kind of stuff rather than just dropping them off. The issue with what I just said though, with the spending a lot of time with them is scale. It's really hard to scale that. We only have one Jonathan, we have one me, we have one Alex. So if the president of the university comes and says, all right, y'all are doing student-driven security stuff. You, you want to train all these people. Uh, here's funding for 15 more students. It immediately becomes a very hard thing to do to train 15 people if Jonathan has to rotate through all 15 of them. It's even harder if five of them are in Aiken, five of them are in Spartanburg, and five of them in, are in Columbia. So, the other part about that is you're, there's an analogy that y'all might have heard about before that the Grug gave in a talk a few years ago having to do with hacking and defending. And it came down to the beginning of when we were doing this kind of security stuff, let's say in the 90s, it was a lot of individual hacker versus individual defender. So think back to Cuckoo's Egg and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, that isn't scalable, and in war fighting, what happened was you've got these aces in World War II, one ace against another ace. They're fighting each other. Over time, that isn't sustainable, so you have to turn it into a system where you're gonna overwhelm with as many planes as possible. Having Jonathan sit down with people individually, one at a time, is like the World War I one fighter ace, one person learning from the fighter ace, and then they're gonna go off and do their work. We need it to be more like, let's do 15 people at once, get the system working and having them work on stuff. The other thing with this is just looking at that gives you burnout, right? <laughs> you, if you, you have to do that kind of operation all day long, you're not gonna do this kind of work for very long. So what we decided to do about it is do quite a number of things, and that's what these guys are gonna talk about. But in general, what I said was, let's start looking at these things like software problems, partially. So we need to create a system. Systems are kind of like coding. So let's break this into chunks and then either adjust our processes, write code, whatever it takes in order to address that kind of thing. Part of that is coming up with a framework of what needs to happen. And the other thing that I really reinforced is I want the computers to do a lot more for us. Because what ends up happening in that other, in the John Ritter scenario of what are you talking about, 
is you're putting a high cognitive load on the analyst and the person that's learning. Because if you have to ask all those questions and do that stuff manually, then by the time that you get to actually doing the investigation, your brain is already tired. You know, what do you mean I have to find this thing? So killing that part of it is kind of the, uh, the underlying theme of this, this kind of stuff is make the computer do a lot more work. The other part about it is doing a lot more measurement, not for things like, like I'm not a, a super big fan of, you know, these people need to be doing X number of cases per day, all that kind of stuff. That, that's not a good methodology for this kind of environment. But what, how many times have we seen this alert? How many times do, you know, Apache servers get hit and they're out of date? Those kinds of things can turn into uh, feedback for preventive controls and all that kind of stuff, and that really wasn't being done that well. It was very ad hoc. So one of the things with that is I want to highlight the work that Expel does with their blog, expel.io. If you're not familiar with their, their blog and what they write about as far as measurement and quality control and all that kind of stuff, you should check it out. Um, so if there's anyone here from Expel, I salute your, your company's work in that area. So how did we do it? We did it through the work of these two guys. And I will turn it over to Jonathan. All right, can you hear me? Is it working? Oh, cool, it does work. All right, so yeah. Uh, Robert's already mentioned it once that we're a teaching sock. We, uh, we're like, uh, we like to think of ourselves like doctors telling med school students to go reattach that arm, um, but with malware instead. And we, uh, we work almost exclusively with uh, college students. Um, Luckily, we're a university. We can actually take college students in from a computer science program and our IIT program. That works out pretty well. But that's not the only place we get them from. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, don't knock the English majors. And one of the highest flyers we ever had was a biomed engineering major. So, um, yeah, we, so we, are, we recruit from everywhere. We recruited from the Cyber Patriot uh, competition in the United States Air Force. Uh, local high schools, we work with them with their guidance counselors to. Uh, to kind of intercept people coming in. We do job shadowing with, these, uh, with uh, incoming high school students and identify incoming talent. Uh, we get students from all over. Um, happy to have them. We have some rock stars too, let me tell you. And uh, when we get them, what we do is we put them in an immersion program. So uh, Robert mentioned they're, they're flipping burgers two weeks ago and now they're working security incidents. Um, I have not found a good way to do this other than sit them in front of the screen and say, okay, let's just start working it. Oh, so you don't know what an IP address is? Okay, this is an IP address. Literally going from that, uh, that low sometimes all the way up to, okay, here's how you exploit something with a buffer overflow. Um, if you ever try this, get them as close to freshmen as you can. The longer, you're, the more time you can spend with them, the better off you're gonna be. <clears throat> and when we get them in, we, uh, like I mentioned, we just, we sit with them. We give them alerts to work, we don't, Say, okay, well, now you need to go learn how to do X, Y, and Z and go install an operating system. Now we don't do that. Day one, they're working alerts with us. They sit right next to us. Uh, sure, they're deer in the headlights, but they're sitting right next to us. Um, it tends to work out pretty well. We have a curriculum that we also are, are developing, we're building out. Uh, the idea is that we put this curriculum on a SIFT VM. Uh, and as we work alerts, we want them to review this content that we have too. So if, we're, if they're uh, reviewing a packet capture, uh, we, want the, we want the material to be available to them to say, okay, how do we even get this packet? So what is a packet? What do you do with the packet? Uh, as uh, Robert was saying, it's not necessarily scalable for me to sit with 15 people and do this 15 times in a semester. Probably won't work. So we're trying to build out methods that will uh, uh, basically automate or otherwise uh, reduce the load on one person. If you ever try this, I'm also going to go ahead and tell you now that cross-training, there's no substitute. 
They say, I've heard this somewhere before, that a uh, security analyst is an IT professional with 10 years of experience. Um, okay, well, this guy's flipping burgers two weeks ago. He doesn't have 10 years of experience. Um, cross train to the best of your ability. Uh, and maybe that'd work for your FTEs too, not just students. So put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's uh, flipping burgers and now they're doing security alerts. They don't know what they don't know. They don't even know where to start. They don't know what authentication is, much less how to see if somebody's uh, from Russia is doing something evil to us. So uh, just sort of help out with that. We kind of built this, uh, this set of milestones for them, and not to mention, I think kids just kind of react well to achievement badges, such as games, you beat Pikachu 500 times, so you get the achievement badge. Uh, you can work authentication alerts, now you get the level one badge. Um, they seem to react to this pretty well. Uh, and we also want to use it to, to sort of prevent burnout too. Uh, if you stare at alerts for six months, I don't know if anybody here has worked in a stock, probably most of you have at least at one point. Um, nothing but alerts can burn you out. Hence, engineering development and stock achievement badges at the bottom. Uh, what we would really like to do, in my perfect world, if I had a magic wand, um, the students who come in, by the time they leave, can do all of these. Is that realistic? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But it's what I'm shooting for, shooting for the stars. Uh, this is the most hated phrase in the sock, is, is it real and do I care? We drill this, all right? This is, if you're, you've probably taken SANS 504 or you know someone who has, it's just the identification step of pick roll, that's all that really is. But laid out in a way that people seem to respond to having no IT experience whatsoever. So that's, uh, Robert's talking about uh, taking in 15 people who've never done this before and train them up on how to do it. This is one of the ways we do it. We drill not what button do you click, not what website do you go to, but how do you get the answer to, to a question such as, uh, this web server is attacking us, okay? Uh, what is it doing? It's using this exploit, it's an Apache exploit. Okay, is that an Apache web server? No, it's an IS web server. Okay, is it real, do we care? No, we don't care. Just move on, next alert. It didn't work. However, let's say we did care. Let's say it wasn't an Apache exploit against an Apache web server. It was vulnerable, so on and so forth. We have it sort of laid out for them in a way that can help guide them to the point where they know that, oh, we need to escalate this because that IOC hit. And if I'm talking about uh, drilling, is it real and do I care? You didn't see the whole conversation up on the screen right now, but it's, it's a partial conversation where we're working with some students on how to uh, remediate an authentication compromise. Um, I really wish I could have put more of this up there. I really loved this conversation. This was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Dayon here is pointing out very cool things that you can't see all of it, but she's pointing out her evidence that this is an automated attack by various means. She, I could only get on here uh, going through the list in alphabetical order. But point being, she did it. She's graduating. Uh, so it looks like she's going to move on to a very nice company too, by the way. Uh, so what we wanted to do, by the time that we're done with them, by the time they're moving away from us, I would love for them to be able to take an alert, like that, what you see up on this, uh, this screen, it's a uh, suspicious inbox manipulation rule. Pull out the IOCs, map it to such tools as the uh, Pyramid of Pain, basically explain to me what you do with this data. So what, you got an alert. I don't care that you got an alert. What does it tell you? What was the impact? To me, that's the secret sauce. When they can say that, when they can say, not that we had a malware alert, but instead that they say, we had a executable that came from a Russian web server and it can steal passwords because it hooks the kernel. Awesome. That's what we're going for. And that's what we're trying to train. We don't want, we don't want alert cleared people. We want, we want analysts. So to uh, Robert's point, there can only be one, only one of me, I can only sit with so many people at once. Um, they tried cloning me, it didn't work. The, so the idea is to take as much as we can, all the common stuff that we see, account compromises, malware, whatever, write essentially, you know, you probably know these things, they're called playbooks, uh, and distribute them to the students as alerts come across the wire. Uh, along with our curriculum stuff too, by the way. So if you need to know how to uh, do basic analysis of malware, uh, hopefully, what well, we do actually now, we have a, uh, 
curriculum item for that, essentially a knowledge base, a knowledge base item for that, along with a playbook. The idea is why couldn't we take what I would have said in this chat, turn it into something like this, and just ship it right along with the alert. That could happen automatically in the, okay, now we're reaching that scalability issue that uh, Robert was talking about. There can only be one of me, there's 15 students, can't sit with them all. Cool, let's automate the, uh, what I would have said anyways. To give you an idea of what we would attach to an alert as it goes by, and I'll go ahead and tell you right now, the second item there, APT, students don't work, Russian compromises. Uh, they're not getting the ransomware cases. Uh, but, but, if we do it right, they, when they leave, they will have seen what you're supposed to do. They would, if whenever they go to work for someone here, they would say, yeah, I know what to do when ransomware shows up, you fire up your resume. And, uh, on the right hand side, to just give you an example, what would we show them? What would we give them as a, a set of steps? So the, the Teams chat from a couple of slides back, that was all ad hoc. This, uh, clearly more sustainable, more repeatable, They've seen it 10 times now, they don't need to see it anymore. They've drilled it, they've got it. By the time they leave us, they know how to do these things. The things up on the screen right now. So in my experience, what can a student be trained to do? Uh, the answer is it depends. 50% of the time it works every time, is what I would say. We uh, tend to produce two types of graduates. One is a security analyst and the other is a developer, and it's about 50-50 split. Uh, for the developers, I say it's not necessarily, of course I want to produce security people, of course I do. Uh, but when we produce a developer instead, I don't call it a, a defeat or anything because now they're scared straight developers. They've seen what happens whenever you don't, uh, say, sanitize your user input correctly. Um, you know, they're better off, they're better off, even if they don't go into security, that's cool. Uh, so, I wanted to give you an example of, I guess you just call it a success story. Uh, Y'all remember LogForge? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Robert and I, we're at USC, LogForge, uh, well, LogForge happens. We're up to our ears in work. We can't do soft work right now. We're not triaging uh, alerts. We're not even working with the students right now. We don't have time. We're in panic mode. Fortnite's down. We gotta go. So the, uh, so our students were basically left alone. That's what it basically means. Uh, alone to triage alerts all by themselves. I can't sit next to them right now. And I'm happy to report that we had a, a real breach, well, we can't call it a breach because it's not, it wasn't that. We had a real attack that the, our students were able to handle independently where there was a lot of activity, a lot of artifacts, we'll say, and a lot of remediation to do. They did it correctly, they did it right, and I only had small amounts of almost just nitpicking kind of I would have done this differently. They, they handled it very well, being my point. Uh, that was blog towards that time frame. It's right about then when I thought, hey, we're starting to get this thing right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, cool. We've done it. We've, uh, we know that we can do it. We know that we need to scale it up. We know that uh, we know how to win and that's, that's, where, that's where we're going, and what we need to do, what we need to get better at scaling, we need to get better at automation, essentially. Um, Robert saw this, Robert knew this, Robert hired Alex. Cool, cool, so <clears throat> a couple things. One, there was a Highlander quote, and uh, it was backwards, and that's my fault, sorry. I didn't realize it until now. It can be only one, not there can only be one. So 80s movies fans, that's on me. Um, number two, uh, I couldn't even remember how to do PowerPoint slide transitions. It's been so long. It's like such a bad practice now that I was in there for like 10 minutes. How do I make the glass break? What, how does this work? Didn't we used to do this all the time? Couldn't remember at all. Um, but I figured it out eventually, so there. That's the last one, I promise now. Uh, so as Robert said, I am fairly new to the university. It's been six-ish, seven-ish months, something like that, uh, serving as the lead security engineer and you know, I have my, of course, official responsibilities, but what I take on as my duty is, the reason I came to the university in the first place is that I wanted to help the students. I want, I was a university student at the University of South Carolina, Comp Sci. I want to help the university students that are there who are Comp Sci. And so, uh, everything that I do revolves around making sure that we set them up to make way more money than we're making today. That, that's all it's about. Um, 
in addition to that, you know, we're talking about security. I know we're talking about our SOC and making sure that I add efficiency and process improvement. So one of the things we look at or I look at are bottlenecks, duplicate work, unnecessary work. I'll talk about that in detail in just a bit. Uh, go over how we work through the educational part of being a teaching SOC, as Robert said. Collecting measurements, metrics. Um, you know, as Robert said, it's political. And, you know, we, we depend upon tax revenue. And tax revenue does not get doled out like fine wine. You know, you've got to be able to indicate what these guys are doing are, is, uh, we have to be able to show value as to what it is that we're doing. We're not just a bunch of nerds and they're talking about Star Wars, like this is serious business. We're really preventing um, some serious attacks. Automation, I'll talk about that. Technical inclusivity, an important concept, a whole slide on that one. And then not just the SOC, which uh, may be something you experience in your environments, maybe not, but I'm gonna hop on that one as well. So first things first, right? Um, but bottlenecks, unnecessary work, duplicate work, how can I, as the lead security engineer, start to alleviate some of those problems? Um, so we start with bottlenecks. As Robert said, Jonathan, I'm sorry, I'm walking around if I'm messing up the web thing here. Let me stand right here. Uh, Jonathan's been here since 1801. I think he, he, you did the groundbreaking, right? You founded the university, yes. Yeah, he had a powdered wig on and everything. It was, it's, we've got photos from 1801. Um, no, Jonathan is a bottleneck himself because of his institutional knowledge, because he brings so much to the sock that if Jonathan were to win the lottery, what are we going to do? A lot of that goes away. I'm sure we've all been in jobs when we left, we took a lot of institutional knowledge with us and kind of left them with the bag, so to speak. So one of my jobs, lead security engineer, one of the first things I did was sit down with Jonathan, try to learn what it is that Jonathan has, then find the gaps. Not just little things like, how do you log into this service or that service, but what is the process that you use? Where is that documented? How are we going to continue this when you know, Jeff Bezos calls you and offers you a half a million dollar a year job? The aspiration for all of us, right? Just a call from Jeff Bezos at random, you know? We'd all let it go to voicemail. Uh, so those are, the, yes, and those are the types of human bottlenecks we're trying to work through. And there's technical bottlenecks as well. Again, we've got uh, services that may not be working efficiently. We've got a lack of services, um, a, a lack of monitoring in some areas where we need increased monitoring. So it's my responsibility to get in there and figure out how we can make improvements. Uh, I take a look at unnecessary work. Initially, we were in the office right now. We're a little more remote than we were. This is obviously harder in the work from home era, but I'm just shoulder surf. Like, just show me what it is you do. How do you do it? I'm not trying to guide you down a path. What is it you do? And we start finding things like Jonathan uses the, uh, the web interface to get some enrichment for a particular alert. Someone else uses Cortex to do the enrichment for the particular. Someone else is using a CLI tool to get the same enrichment for the same alert. You don't see those things unless you just sit and observe and understand what people's processes are. And then it's my responsibility to figure out how can I unify that. As Robert said, and I'm going to talk about, how can I get the computer to do it? I think that's actually the next slide. Spoilers. Um, and re reducing a lot of that duplicate work down. Uh, so as I said, right, the reason I'm here is for education. I love the picture here because one of the uh, students that we have actually was in high school in the robotics club. And she, well, she, right? And so we've got she here whatever that means. Uh, we recognize that all of our students are engineers. Okay? All, most of them are computer science. We've got one or two that are not, but they're very strong in some of the same areas. So rather than just tell them what to do, or as Robert pointed out, they don't know how to GTS, we sit them down and inundate them with what we're doing. And they'll pick up a lot of it. So for example, this particular student, um, had a real vigor for learning all these things that she had never encountered before. I want to do Azure stuff. Cool. I've got a meeting at 2 o'clock with Mandiant. We've got to set up our service with them. Join. And then she just gets blown away with no chance to ask questions because it's two engineers trying to get the job done in 30 minutes. But you're here. You're looking at the portal. You're looking at us build resources. You're looking at us just quickly take care of things. And then she can come back later 
and say, hey, what did you mean by platform as a service? What is that all about? Then I can explain it to her. Feel free to take all the notes you want. Uh, we, I've put her in scenarios, we've put her in scenarios where uh, we talk about threat hunting and running queries. And she's like, what is, what is the querying language? Great, sit down, let's talk about KQL. Right, and we walk her through KQL. And the funny thing was, I had never used KQL, and I had to walk her through it. And I was like, Yeah, that, that works. That looks good. Sure, you know, we use SQL. I mean, that's all the same stuff, right? But that's what it's about: is inclusivity. We we treat them first class. They are engineers. They are to us full-time engineers, even if they can only come in three hours a week, four hours a week, whatever it may be, because of their class schedules. They're first class. All of that documentation that Jonathan showed, the graphs, the um, you guys probably had to clean your eye for some of the markdown, uh, default, uh, uh, UI, but all that is all done with documentation as code, and all of those students pull down the code and they make corrections to it. One of our students has pulled it down and we've helped, uh, he has built a continuous integration pipeline for the code. So he's had to go do some not so fun work of cleaning up Jonathan's typos, but He's constantly in there. He's constantly having to read it. He's constantly having to learn about it, step back and understand it. So it's, just, it's a hands-on thing. And that's true for everything that we're working through. Our infrastructure is code. Our students pull down, they work on. The app dev is code, LOL. Anything that I'm working on in terms of new applications, join me. I'll break something out into a microservice, totally sovereign, and you can work on that part. And if I have to work around the fact that you know, you're gonna be in school, it's gonna take you six months to do what might take me six days, no problem. I'll work around that and we'll, I'll, include, I'll loop you back in as soon as I can. I mentioned querying and hunting as code. DevOps, uh, it's so funny. So um, Mr. Lambert, Mr. Wes Lambert, who just presented here, had a picture of Steve Urkel and did I do that when he mentioned DevOps. And I was this close to putting a picture of myself as Steve Urkel from Halloween on here. And then I had a WWMBD moment. And I was like, you know, what would Mark Baggett do? Would he make a change <laughs> five minutes before he went live? I don't know, and I chose against it, but I, you know, maybe he'll tell me afterwards if that's the case. But no, uh, we are constantly trying to roll out more and more uh, DevOps environment stuff, and we always include them as a part of it. They're learning how to do pull requests as some of the full times, not only in our SOC, but elsewhere are learning how to do it. We treat them as first class so that they're getting educated uh, as hands-on as can be. But as Robert said, some of that manual work ain't got to be manual work. When I came into this thing, I said straight up, humans do human work, computers do computer work. And we've got to put our nose in the air sometimes and separate the two. We've got to recognize that while there may be, we are a state agency, and there may be people who've been working on this one thing for 10 years, and it's their one kind of manual job, we've got to be able to go in there and say, sorry, I can write a Python script and knock this out you know, in seconds. And, and, and that's good, because humans can do such a higher level of cognitive work that now we can use your skill set elsewhere. Automation is a great thing. Automation is not about taking away jobs, not about taking away positions. It's about allowing you to do the things you're actually passionate about. If I can get you out of Excel, I bet everybody in here would be happy to hear that, right? Like nobody really, maybe there's one or two of you, I apologize, I, you know, not me. Um, but some of that is, some of the automation we are working through, right, threat integration, again, there's Cortex, which is great, but we, uh, we do it in other ways as well, right? We're not disparaging tools in the slightest, but we have to be able to do that. As Robert said, when the alert comes in, shouldn't all that just already be there? And it should. Uh, historical data, again, building some of the context that Robert talked about with measurements and metrics, we should be able to automate a lot of those processes. So uh, again, we think of humans as being narrative creatures. That first image is the slide that Robert showed with the hive, and underneath it is some of the work that we're working through that just provides more context automatically. I showed the Play School, Fisher Price, phone, don't sue me. Uh, but some of that can be challenging for a student in the, hive, uh, in the hive, because the hive does, it's built for engineers. 
And some of these students, as Robert said, literally are coming from Chick-fil-A, and, and that's what they're doing. They don't have any familiarity. So how can I, as the engineer, abstract some of that away and make it one button click? How can I abstract some of that detail away and make it as narrative as it's possible? So much so that our goal is to make it totally narrative, for them to be able to read one or two sentences, quick paragraph that explains exactly what's going on to give them context as quickly as possible. So we're moving towards that and it takes automation to get there. So hopefully all that's pretty clear, but that's our ultimate goal. And this is not just in our SOC. So I don't know what kind of environments you guys have, but um, we have a network team, we have a firewall team, we have uh, infrastructure teams, and what can we do with them? How can we incorporate everything we just talked about with them so that we can reduce some of the volume of alerts and alarms that we're getting on our side and help them become more efficient in the process? And so we include them along the ride. When we try new things, we always, they bring us in. Um, when they're looking at changing their processes. And it's just this uh, symbiotic relationship, right? Synergy, as they said in the year 2000, uh, between all of us. And it helps to just save time, it saves money, it saves energy, it saves effort. And incorporating the process ultimately saves all of us headaches. And that's the goal, that's the key. So we're, everything we're talking about doing with the students, we continue to do as well with our full times outside of the SOC. And I will pass it back to Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Get all this stuff on properly. All right. So that's a lot of stuff. And hopefully some of it y'all can think about and either take back to your environments and figure out whether or not some of that is applicable to you. I think the part, part of really what we want to reinforce is that a lot of this started to sound like doing SRE work and DevOps stuff with the security con in, in a security context. And once we came to that conclusion, we started more or less going to town and looking at everything. You know, what, oh, that sounds like something that you should actually have a repo for. You know, that's just something that somebody's right, you know, like documentation, or, uh, detections, all that kind of stuff. But what that causes also is for you to think about the entirety of a life cycle of processes. And how do you track something from the beginning to the end? How do you know when, when, whether or not you're, you're getting value or not from them? Um, all, all that kind of thing. And then the other big one is abstracting the person out of the process as much as you can. And that's what we're talking about with formalized guidance and creating systems so that Jonathan can take some time off and, you know, Jonathan can teach more people via the, this framework and these tools than he could if he just sat down and asked somebody, what is it that you want to learn about? Um, the other things that I want to say is to just please don't overlook people at the beginning of their career and don't, yep, um, they, you, uh, Andrew Thompson from Mandiant on Twitter the other day said, posted something about what is it that you are the most proud of? And tons of security people, you know, responding about all kinds of reasons or whatever. And for us, it's the students that are coming out of our, our program. Because this is a massive uh, need in the industry, but it's more than that. It's that you're respecting people in the beginning of their career, making sure that they're getting all the, all the stuff that they need to be a success, and all of that kind of thing. So uh, Chris Sanders isn't here, I don't believe, but I wanted to also give a quick shout out to the Rural Tech Fund. So. All of us are from rural places in South Carolina. Um, we're all engineers, and the work that the Rural Tech Fund is doing uh, is helping that, those kids 
all over the United States. So if you don't contribute to that, maybe um, consider, consider doing that. So I guess we can do some questions. I don't know about timing or, yeah. Okay, uh, Josh. Yeah, so some of them, some of them are computer science students, and some of them aren't. So the majority of them are either computer science or what we call integrated information technology, which is kind of like the old whatever it was called MIS kind of stuff. So basically, the people that don't do data structures and algorithm analysis, those those people. Yeah, so we, that's a combination of things. So we recruit, we go and talk to classes, but we, a lot of it is by uh, word of mouth. And then we talk to high school teachers, that, especially people that um, mentor Cyber Patriot and, and stuff like that to, say, to see, because we really want people to start in the SOC when they're freshmen. So by the time that by the time that they graduate, they're you know they go work wherever they want to, make hundred fifty thousand dollars, whatever. Um, that that's kind of the goal. But I mean, I so I have an English degree. Uh, one of the one of the sharpest people that we have right now. Everybody is sharp, but one of the sharpest people that we have. Uh, he he's getting an Eng English degree also. So in anybody? Yep. Yeah, we, we do have a competition. So the question was, do we have a competition teams for like CTF kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, so that's all handled through our College of Engineering and Computing. Um, so what, what we end up doing with that is we, we are somewhat hands off with that process because they are computer science professors, so to get back to the politics stuff, there are computer science professors that would that have an interest in that, and they, they tend to be more involved in that part. Um, but yeah, we, we help them as needed, more more or less. Yeah, that that happens sometimes. Um, it's strange, and that, that's something that we we could do a lot better job at with making sure that everybody knows what all kind of opportunities there are at the university. So there may be some kids that have gone through that, those teams that don't even know that they can even work in the SOC. So that, that's the kind of stuff that we are continuing to, to work on. Um, so we're exploring hiring an academic. So the, the issue with that is in order to get credit, you need, you need to have somebody that can be a instructor, you know, or a professor or whatever. And unfortunately, a GSE doesn't qualify you. Um, you know, so we, while we can uh, teach people how to do stuff, we, you know, we, we, don't, ha we don't have the creds, we don't have the academic creds to, to, to do that part. Um, so we, we're actually, considering hiring someone for, for that exact reason. Yeah, we have to, so we end up doing both. We'll do formalized we, we do formalized meetings, you know, so, and that kind of stuff happens more often in the summer. Um, and, and actually this past summer, we mentored people through doing Security Plus because it's relatively inexpensive cert and all, all that kind of stuff. So we'll set up, you know, like an hour we'll spend on networking, an hour we'll spend on uh, cloud resources, all that kind of stuff. But then that what, Jonathan and Alex were talking about about getting the curriculum to them as, as as close to the person as possible. We do that all through uh, a, an analyst workstation that pulls down stuff, um, markdown that the students actually also work on. 
that gets pulled to them. So we'll say, all right, we're going to look at this, we're going to look at this. Um, and then we interact with them all day, more or less, via Teams. And then, so what will happen will be there, an incident will come up and we'll say, all right, we're going to go through this, everybody get on the call, and somebody will, will go through it with them. Yeah, so we don't monitor student networks. Okay. So that, that's how we get around that. We don't want to monitor student networks. So back, back at the beginning where we run our own ISP, the ISP is only monitored if the Fed sent us a notice. So if that happens, they, it gets monitored. Otherwise, it's Wild West. Um, so the students, the students monitor students in terms of, let's say there's an impossible travel alert and you know, so some student mailbox gets popped or whatever and is sending out fish stuff, but not down to content or their machines or any, any of that kind of stuff. Okay. 